Hello, everyone. Well, it's just uh, really fun to be here and uh, really great for me to be back to, to MIT. Julian and Neil feels like they're just back with family, and so it's nice to, to meet all of you tonight as well. So Jeff and I are going to do a, a tag team and just about 10 minutes each so we can have lots of times for a Q&A. So I thought I would um, kind of just set the stage as uh, given that uh, the last couple of years I've uh, been down at NASA and uh, kind of my life is exploration. And when we think about uh, why, why explore, what, what about exploration, I'll show you this uh, kind of a dim light. But there's really three enduring questions. This is an incredible image from the Hubble Space Telescope. Thanks, Jeff, for repairing it. <laughs> so are we alone? Are there other habitable planets? And what about life? Current or past life in the solar system? And the evidence is mounting. And I'll make a wild prediction right up front. I think within the next decade, uh, we'll probably find uh, the life somewhere in the solar system. It could be past life. It might be 3.5 billion year old life, but still that counts. We are on our way to becoming interplanetary. So um, one thing about uh, having the honor to serve as Deputy Minister of NASA, I got to study 100 space science missions. I'm an aerospace engineer, right? And usually uh, specialize in astronauts and trying to get astronauts to Mars. But uh, hopefully you know about the, the new Trappist-5. It's just like exoplanets. 20 years ago, we didn't have this discipline. We didn't have this field. Now we have 6,000 exoplanets out there looking for Earth-like planets. So. Uh, again, just the scale of things is, is pretty mind-boggling. Now, 1,200 of those exoplanets have been put in a catalog, NASA put them up, and a couple dozen of them are really important. We call them in the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, might be just right. Might be just right for, you know, kind of the chemical constituents to, to harbor life, life of some form. So just, a, just an amazing kind of a... Shout out to all of the great, you know, science and uh, important science missions. Again, 100 missions that NASA is doing. I really like this slide. I'm not, hopefully you can see it. But we talk about ocean worlds. We go to search in the, the universe to look for life. Well, I think Earth is the most important. I call it Spaceship Earth. And this is to scale. These are the other places in the solar system. Uh, Europa would be a mission, you know, to Europa because it. Uh, definitely has a uh, water and underneath the whole bunch of devices. Enceladus, a little Enceladus to scale up there, but it's talking to us every day. It's spewing hydrogen uh, clouds out from its ice ocean. And you can go through to see Titan and just so many, again, places for to explore, to ask these enduring questions. You know, where do we come from? What's the solar system made up of? And so these are just some, some recent highlights of, again, the many, many incredible uh, scientific discovery and missions going on. This is a, a slide of Journey to Mars. When I got to NASA, I really got to uh, help articulate and plan, and since 2015, um, really make sure to answer those questions. What's NASA doing? Is, is NASA aimless? Do we have a plan? Yes, we have a plan. It's a three-phase plan to get humans to Mars. Starts with the International Space Station. And that goes then to the second phase to get people uh, get to go Earth moon orbit, get back to the moon, especially in, in lunar orbit for all of the 2020s, and then the 2030s get humans to Mars. So Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. So I like to think that, that the current mission to Mars, Mars is a horizon goal. It's really hard. It's really far away. There's a lot of failures, so you take it one step at a time. So a couple images on the International Space Station. I don't think anyone in here is 17 years or younger. Maybe we have some geniuses, but uh, since it is a graduate dorm, but your younger brothers and sisters at home, for the last 17 years, we've had continuous human habitation on International Space Station. In, in our lab, in Mavicola, we specialize in astronaut performance. What about the bones and the muscles? How do we keep the astronauts healthy and well? You know, again, in preparation for these even longer duration missions. So uh, Scott Kelly's one-year mission was, was uh, quite her you know, historic, but the Mars mission is about 3.5 years. So again, this is just a start. It's just moving out. Again, really looking at the physiology, the life support systems, and looking at the technologies to kind of demonstrate on International Space Station. International Space Station is uh, with five member, uh, five member partners, US, NASA, Russia, Japan, Canada, and the European Space Agency, which is 22 nations. But there's over 100 nations who have done experiments, science, and participated on the International Space Station. So I think it's a really good model of maybe the future of exploration as, as well. Um, I can talk a little bit about innovation at NASA. I'll kind of put a framework together. 
uh, because a lot of innovation was going on, but my question was, could we be strategic about it? Could we, you know, do you need to disrupt things? NASA is 60 years next year, full-flown bureaucracy, so we have to have a discussion. $19 billion is a nice budget, but still, you have to think about, you're trying to do a lot of programs, so can you be strategic about um, innovation investments? This is a, an example of public-private partnerships. I called it the new NASA, in terms of relying on the commercial folks for cargo to space station, namely with SpaceX launches and orbital ATK, and in the future, bringing in Sierra Nevada, you know, relying, buying those services, so NASA doesn't have to do everything, but buying those services, investing in the U.S. economy for these uh, companies. And then next up will be commercial crew, and that'll be with SpaceX and the Boeing company. Uh, looks like it'll probably be 2019. Wish it were in 2018, but, you know, it's soon. It's in the next couple of years. So um, really important investments, again, to <coughs> disruptive innovation is how I look at it, because you're, it's not really about the new technology, but it's definitely about changing your business model. It's about organizationally doing things very differently in these public-private partnerships. So uh, that was really incredible to, to be at NASA and, and be able to work on, on these things. Okay, so I wouldn't be an aerospace engineer if I didn't show you airplanes, right? So um, equal shout out to aeronautics just because this is so incredible. These investments in experimental aircraft, this hasn't happened for two decades. Uh, NASA hasn't been able to invest in experimental aircraft. It's really necessary. You see up on the, uh, the top a uh, low, uh, low boom supersonic air transport. If the government can just invest in the money right now that has Lockheed contracted for this, these will be commercialized if the government can put in the necessary seed funds for the next years, maybe decade, but hopefully years. In the middle, you see uh, ultra-efficient aircraft. Um, one on the left is kind of MIT, double bubble, we call it, the D8. Again, ultra-efficient, 50% fuel reduction, and then 50% noise reduction. So again, not 1% to 2% drag reduction, not 50%. So I love these examples of you know really trying to do breakthrough um, technology innovation and the government kind of funding these things. On the bottom, this one is, you probably can't see it, it's, it's a hybrid electric. And that one is actually furthest along. Flies with uh, seven hybrid uh, electric uh, engines on each wing, and then with the conventional engine. But again, so really trying to push um, these new breakthrough innovations in terms of aeronautics, uh, because these potentially contribute the most to our gross domestic product. So these are really important bets, you know, to start this government funding, and then the commercial sector really, really um, take those further. Okay, so I want to come back to Spaceship Earth, and um, this is uh, the 19 um, Earth observing satellites right now in orbit. Space Station probably just uh, flew by, and uh, you basically eyes on Earth. So to take a look at uh, how's, how's Spaceship Earth doing, how's our home planet doing, um, sea temperature, sea rise, um, soil moisture, all these kind of things that we really uh, need to study. Now NASA does this with sister agencies, you know, NOAA and USGS and and other users and operators of the satellites, but NASA is the only one who designs and builds and, and flies the satellites and then works with the other agencies. Um, so this is from Space Station, this image, and the reason I like to use it is that imagine Earth the size of a basketball. You shrink Earth down to scale the size of a basketball. That beautiful glow, that beautiful horizon, that's our life support system. And that would be three human hairs thick on basketball Earth. So that kind of shows you how fragile and precious and incredible, you know, our entire life support system is here. So I think that's a really good perspective um, from the orbital view looking down on, down on Earth. And then uh, show you a little bit of data. This is the last 140 years of data. Average data is going to be white. Um, blue is one to two degrees uh, Celsius uh, below the average, and yellow to orange is one to two degrees uh, Celsius above. Um, for the Americans, that's four degrees Fahrenheit above. So it's 1980. Your great-grandparents are born now. We go turn of the century. Maybe your folks are born now. Oh, Jeff's already born. I'm born. <laughs> Julie, see when you're born. Yeah. So now you've been alive. It's hot. So there's data now actually from 2016 that just broke their records for the hottest year ever recorded. This data is 2015, broke the record, set in 2014. Um, so again, this is, this is the data. Um, 
and you know, it really is on our watch to, to think about, I think, how, how we take care of, of the Earth and, you know, and our contributions and, and things like that, but it's kind of a, a very compelling NASA simulation. And uh, then I want to end to give Jeff his time. Um, one of the funnest things I got to do in, in two years at NASA was get down to Antarctica uh, to take Earth uh, observing measurements, to look at the glaciers and look at how, how they're melting. NASA does campaigns in Greenland and Antarctica, and I was really fortunate to be able to fly over that's Western Antarctica, look at the glaciers, and then made it down to the, the South Pole, which was uh, on my bucket list. So uh, pretty cool. You get to run around the world in three seconds. It was really cold. <laughs> it was worth it. Uh, okay, and so this is, uh, again, just my last slide uh, to pay tribute. Uh, hopefully you've seen the movie, Hidden Figures. Anyone? Everyone? Hope you guys aren't studying that hard. Okay. Well, it was a, you know, it was a, you know, just an incredible book. I think great movie to celebrate and write the history of everyone, everyone who contributes. And and that's Katherine Johnson. She's 98 years young today, and uh, still loves to talk about mathematics and and things like that. But it's really to celebrate all of the unsung heroes and to kind of raise everyone up because again, uh, space flight's hard. It's challenging, but it's really fun, and it really always takes an incredible team. And a lot of these folks are African-American women that were the computers, you know, real computers were women and people originally, and to kind of celebrate all of them and their enormous contributions that, that they made. Now I'll turn it over to, to Jeff. Thanks for your, and we'll have questions after, I think. problems I have when, particularly when I go in and talk to uh, school kids, is I get introduced as an astronaut and then they look at me, he doesn't look like an astronaut. Um, and so, so just to keep my credentials in order. few days, a uh, few years with uh, me and the Hubble Space Telescope, which I'm not going to talk about tonight, but if you have any questions about uh, what we did with the Hubble Space Telescope, what it's doing now, uh, I love to talk about it and be happy to uh, deal with it in, in the question period. But no, what I want to do tonight is uh, something completely different. Uh, my uh, research here at MIT has gone in many, many different directions. And uh, of course, as, as Dave has said, one of the long-term dreams that, that we have is someday uh, to go to Mars. And uh, of course, we have been doing a great job exploring Mars with our robotic explorers. And, and I have to say, I, I never get into this thing of humans versus robots because uh, ultimately, robots paved the way for human exploration. When humans someday do go to Mars, we're not going to throw our robots away. We have humans working with robots, which is one of uh, Julie's uh, research areas. So I love robots, and, and we have learned so much from the series of robots that we've had on Mars. And they've really given us the, the idea that although today Mars is essentially a, a cold, dry uh, desert and, and almost certainly the surface of Mars is devoid of life because it's constantly bombarded by radiation, by uh, cosmic radiation, by ultraviolet rays from the sun, has very little atmosphere, only about 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> Nevertheless, there's a lot of evidence now that in the past, Mars was a very different planet. Uh, it, we, we see features on Mars which, if we saw them on the Earth, would definitely indicate water erosion. Um, minerals on Mars which, again, on Earth, and we have to be very careful just because they look like things on Earth, you can't necessarily assume, but they certainly, these are, are minerals which only form uh, in a salt water environment. And so 
Uh, also, just the, the basic geology, the northern hemisphere of Mars is much lower than the southern hemisphere, and, and we have good reason to believe that uh, billions of years in the past, in the early solar system, Mars actually had an appreciable atmosphere, thick enough to support liquid water on its surface, had a greenhouse effect. Um, unfortunately, the current theory is that just like the, the Earth's, uh, we, we're actually protected from the solar wind, from a lot of cosmic radiation by our magnetic field, which is sustained because the Earth has a liquid iron core and it's turning around and iron is electrically conductive and that runs a magneto, which in turn generates the Earth's magnetic field and maintains it and the Earth's magnetic field deflects the solar wind, deflects cosmic radiation which is a good thing for us here on Earth. Mars is much smaller than the Earth. It cooled down. Uh, we have evidence that there once was a, a, a fossil magnetic field, but once the liquid iron core solidified, the magnetic field collapsed, and Mars was exposed to the full force of the solar wind, which ripped away its atmosphere. No more greenhouse effect. Uh, it cooled down. Today, Mars has an atmosphere only about 1% of the Earth, and I'll talk about that later. But nevertheless, we know now, we have evidence from here on Earth that really, as soon as the Earth cooled down enough and liquid water formed on the Earth, life started up very, very early in the Earth's history. Of course, it took a few billion years before life became complex, but did life start out on Mars during that time when we think Mars was much more Earth-like? And if so, what happened to it? And so that's, that's really one of the most fascinating goals for exploring Mars. Of course, we want to understand its geological history. But um, also, you know, if... And, and our rovers have done a, a great job at, at elucidating this, but if there were organisms which once were alive on Mars, what would they have done when Mars started to lose its atmosphere and cool down? Well, on Earth, everywhere where we have liquid water here on Earth, we find life, sometimes just microorganisms, and they've learned how to live in incredibly hostile environments. We have microorganisms, bacteria, which live kilometers underground. They've learned how to metabolize rock. Uh, if those organisms ever evolved on Mars, they could care less that Mars doesn't have an atmosphere now. They'd be fat, dumb, and happy, and maybe still going strong. And uh, there may be fossil remains of, of some microorganisms on Mars. Our robots really don't have the capability of digging really deep in below the ground. They don't have the capability of finding micro, fo microorganism fossils. Um, so someday we're going to want to send people. Mars, the more we learn about it, Mars is such a fascinating place. It deserves to be explored as well as is humanly possible. And that means ultimately with humans. But that presents a problem. When we send explorers there, are we going to get Mark Watney back from Mars, right? Um, and uh, you, you hear some talk about how some people might be willing to take a one-way trip to Mars. Well, more power to them. But I think the certainly if NASA sends people to Mars, we're going to want to get them back home. And that means we need a what we call a Mars ascent vehicle. Again, well, hopefully most of you have seen the Martian. You saw them take off. Uh, and they'll go up and hook up with their ride back to Earth, whatever that may be. We don't know what form uh, those ascent vehicles are going to take, but they're going to need one heck of a lot of propellant. Uh, you know, a rocket needs fuel and an oxidizer. Um, oxidizer is probably going to be liquid oxygen. The fuel may be hydrogen. It may be methane. You're going to need on the order of tens of tons just of oxygen for the propellant to get off the surface of Mars. 
if we had to take all that oxygen with us from the Earth just to bring it to the surface of Mars, that's a lot of stuff that you have to launch. And we'll talk about that, but that's the um, that that's the reason why we are interested in learning how to use what we call in situ resources. It's that's a fancy word for saying living off the land, which is what explorers have done since time immemorial. You know, when the uh, Polynesians went from island to island. When you'd come to a new island, you'd st stock up on supplies. Uh, when the Europeans came to the New World, they, they were able to replenish their supplies and survive. They couldn't have survived very long on what they were able to lo load onto their ships. So that's the purpose of the experiment that I'm working on, that, that David mentioned. I'm the deputy principal investigator. Uh, principal investigator is a uh, scientist from MIT Haystack Observatory. Ironically, I started life as an astronomer and I was working here at MIT back in the mid to late 70s and Mike Heck, the, the principal investigator, was, was my graduate student at the time. So now I'm working for him. <laughs> life, life goes on. Uh, and probably nobody here is old enough to remember the real Moxie, which was a very popular drink. It was back at the, in the early 20th century, it was the most popular soft drink in the United States. By the way, I want you to read, read all those fantastic things that Moxie does for you, especially uh, some of the masculine problems that it claims to be able to solve. Um, anyway, Moxie lost out to Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, and now Moxie is it's still produced in, in Maine. It's owned by the Coca-Cola company. But here's the deal. Um, you know, whether we use hydrogen or, or methane as a, as a fuel, uh, three-quarters to four-fifths of the mass of the propellant is oxygen. And, you know, it's probably going to be a 50-ton vehicle on that order, which means you're talking about 30 metric tons of oxygen to get off the surface of Mars. To get one ton of anything, uh, on to the surface of Mars, you need about 15 tons of propellant in low Earth orbit to get it out of Earth orbit, to get it to Mars, and to land on the surface. So you can you can do the arithmetic. That that is hundreds of tons of propellant, and that propellant would have to be launched by uh, big rockets. The the uh, space launch system, which NASA is now working on in its final form, is supposed to have about 120, 130 tons capacity to low Earth orbit. So minimum of three launches, and, and these are expensive rockets. So what we propose to do is to produce oxygen on the surface of Mars using local Mars resources, in situ resource utilization, or ISRU. And the technique we're going to use on MOXIE, you've all done in high school chemistry, you know, you stick two electrodes into a glass of water, hook them up to a battery, and lo and behold, hydrogen comes out one side and oxygen comes out the other side. Well, we do the same thing with MOXIE, except we use the carbon dioxide that makes up 96% of Mars' atmosphere. Mars still, as I said, has a very thin atmosphere. It's only about 1% the density of Earth's atmosphere, but it's there, and it's 96% carbon dioxide. So this is basically what MOXIE uh, consists of. We, we start out with a, a filter, because Mars' atmosphere has a lot of dust, so we suck the atmosphere in. We basically use a pump to compress it up to about Earth's atmospheric density, and then we put it into an electrolysis unit. It's a lot more complicated than just putting two electrodes into a glass of water. It's solid oxide, uh, electrolyte, uh, the cathode has a fancy nickel catalyst in it, um, the electrolyte is yttrium stabilized zirconium. Um, it, it gets pretty complicated and I'm not going to go into a um, detailed explanation of how MOXIE works, although I can certainly answer questions about it. We have tests set up for MOXIE, and hopefully, now we're, we're only going to 
produce a few grams an hour of oxygen. It's a, it's a test of the technology. This is a technology which has been demonstrated in laboratories on the Earth, but the way NASA works, if you ever want a critical technology for a mission, and you know, if we are going to send people to Mars and we're counting on a system to produce oxygen for them, that's pretty critical. And so we have to test that technology in the real environment, which means taking this experiment and doing it on Mars. Um, and that's what MOXIE is all about. Ultimately, it, hopefully it will work. But we're not going to do anything with the oxygen on Mars. We don't have any people to breathe it. We don't have any rockets to fuel up with it. We're just going to measure it, make sure of its purity, and demonstrate that Mars doesn't have any nasty surprises for a process which, as I say, we, we know works in the laboratory. So that's basically the MOXIE story. And I'll just finish by mentioning that uh, back in the old days in uh, MOXIE advertisements, they, they would advertise MOXIE with really strange vehicles. Uh, if you look at the horse, uh, you might notice that there's a steering wheel on top of the horse. That's not a real horse. People would drive around and advertise MOXIE. And so in that tradition, we have a nice strange vehicle for our new MOXIE. It's the uh, Mars 2020 rover, which will be very similar to the Curiosity rover, which is uh, doing great work on the surface of Mars. And the vision we have, if, if all this works, ultimately it's the first step in a very long process of learning how to live and work ultimately on the surface of Mars. So uh, it's, I'm never going to get to Mars myself, but it's sure exciting to be working on an experiment which ultimately, I hope, will help people sometime that they get to Mars. So that's the story of MOXIE, and uh, I think you can see how it fits into the big picture of what NASA is doing that Davis showed. And at this point, I guess we're ready to take some questions. Thank you so much, professors. Uh, first question, and these questions were submitted uh, in advance and, and curtailed. Um, how have you seen public attitude in space exploration shift since the beginning of the space age? Um, and how do we keep the public interested in space exploration in the future, given other concerns, such as economic or cultural? Well, I'll start, because I'm probably the oldest. I may be the oldest person in the room. I'm not Sure, but <laughs> in any case, I'm old enough that I uh, I was a kid before Sputnik was launched, before uh, Yuri Gagarin and, and John Glenn and Alan Shepard went into space. Uh, so my childhood was spent uh, amidst the excitement of the coming space age. It was all over the newspapers, magazines, television shows, and, and of course, space was something completely new and exciting. And then it became the subject of, of the Cold War race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Those were very unique times, and I, I don't think that it would be reasonable to assume that something like that is going to come back. Um, there's no question that the public likes things that are new, and I think that, um, I mean, NASA is doing a, a lot of new and, and exciting things, as, as David pointed out. Uh, but I think one of the things that's most likely to intrigue the public uh, is what David talked about, the public-private partnerships and the fact that so many private companies now in America are developing access to space and are going to offer this to a much larger number of people than just astronauts like me who have been lucky enough to go into space. And when that happens, you know, we have... Uh, First, it will be the suborbital flights, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin are getting ready to go, uh, hopefully within another year or so. 
And uh, I think that is going to really capture people's imagination. You have Bob Bigelow who made his play. We have this generation of billionaires. They're space nuts. It's great. Um, Jeff Bezos, he says he's selling, he's selling a billion dollars of his Amazon stock every year to invest in his space company. Um, you know, and, and Elon Musk, uh, Bob Bigelow made his fortune in budget motels. He wants to build a space hotel out of inflatable modules, which is a technology that he basically got from NASA. So there's a lot of exciting things in human space flight um, in the future. And there's no question the media, is, they, they deliver news. And news is something that is new. And the space station these days, um, you know, maybe if some, when Scott Kelly went up for a year, that was news. But normally people don't hear that much about it. But there's going to be a lot of news in the future. I'm just that, um, you know, I do a lot of, of speaking, especially love to go to, you know, teach young kids and, and um, every single girl and boy out there, they're excited. So uh, the other thing is that with NASA and with space travel, we just, we have the excitement. And I think we need to capitalize on that. And um, it raises humanity, you know, get, Mars is really hard. It's really far. I have this infographic sometimes I, I show and how many failures in the early Mars missions of the rovers. Like Jeff said, 50 years we've been trying to get to Mars. Well, it's important to also celebrate the failures because we learned, we learned now the last decade, last 15 years, the world is going to Mars. Seven assets on Mars today. And NASA has two rovers and three orbiters, but the Indian Space Agency is there with MOM. It's a great acronym, the Mars Observer. And um, now ExoMars. So again, kids are kids in the next generation. Actually, anyone who's in school, so it's most of you and younger, I call the Mars generation. You know, X, Y, millennials, like the Mars generation, because you're gonna, it'll be someone, hopefully in this room, actually, you no know, first boots on Mars. So, uh, but we know that, you know, young people are excited, and that's really important for Mars time, because um, are they gonna be astronauts? Not all of us, there's gonna be many more, as Jess said, in, in low with orbit, we're gonna have a lot of people, because people are interested in exploring and pushing. But uh, for me, it's just to show, show all of us. Uh, you just kind of try to make those things that you think are impossible, you make them possible. And, you know, I'm here because of the Apollo program. You know, I didn't, you know, because I grew up in Montana, and, you know, young girl growing up in Montana, but we got to the moon. That was pretty cool. So, so maybe I could be part of that. So, again, I think when it comes to the public and just um, making sure that everyone knows it's for them, we, you know, the U.S., but, you know, international cooperation and just kind of raising humanity's potential to say we can do this. I don't think it'll be kind of so much a space race that we had, the U.S. and the Soviet Union back then, but uh, there's an opportunity to do it together in terms of global cooperation, so that's what I'd like to think about. Uh, as we look forward uh, to this sort of new chapter in the space age uh, heading toward Mars, a number of challenges lie ahead, uh, and you touched on a number of them, uh, both of you. Um, <coughs> Uh, one of them that is uh, probably very concerning for, for, for me in particular as a, as a bioengineer um, is this idea that uh, there can be some physical and, and mental tolls uh, on, on astronauts. So uh, how do you see those challenges and, and how can we help as researchers? Okay, I'll take this one first. So um, it's a great question. Thanks for it. It's a loaded one. So there's, we have, a, you know, the physiology in terms of what we really need to figure out. Mars is about a three and a half year trip. As Jeff mentioned, it is a round trip for any world governments that we're going to bring the people back. Um, definitely, you're going to really miss your family. You know, it's kind of romanticized, but, you know, there's a reason. I showed you Antarctica. It's beautiful, but there's a reason we don't have a lot of population in Antarctica. It's a really harsh environment, right? Well, Mars is orders of magnitude harsher and colder. So, once we get kind of after the, the romanticism, people are going to want to come back, you know, after they've had that experience, I believe. Um, but anyhow, so we have to figure out the radiation first and foremost, um, galactic cosmic rays in particular, when we get to, to Mars. That is something that there's research going on, but we really, what's the protection going to be for the people? I'm sure, there's solar uh, radiation events well, but I think galactic cosmic uh, radiation, you know, we really, really need to study that much more. Uh, bones and muscles, musculoskeletal system. So in long duration space flight, you might lose 30% uh, muscle atrophy, 40% strength loss. You can regain that when you, you come back, but the bone loss is still pretty significant, and that's with a lot of exercise. So you know, I don't know think about um, artificial gravity. You know, do you need to spin someone up? So you really do have to think about the physiology. Then we have a lot of other physiological effects that aren't quite as serious. 
um, cardiovascular, neurovestibular, kind of your balance, all these. So we look at all the different systems. And we have a new issue that we never had you know, during shuttle flights and shorter duration now is with our, with our um, eyes. We have interocular pressure and folks are um, having trouble with some vision. Not everybody, but some. So we look at all these challenges and say, well, what can we, we call them countermeasures. You know, what, what can we do in terms of research and design to counter those, those you know, physiological effects? And I think right up in my top three is uh, psychosocial, right? The human factors. You are locked in something smaller than your bathroom with four people, let's say, and uh, three and a half years, right? And you know, they can't kill each other. You know, you have to get along, you know, you have to get along with someone locked in a very isolated, confined environment for a very long time. So those are, that's kind of my list of, of all where, you know, the research, the kind of the high priority research from the human physiology side. Uh, next question. Uh, politically, we've seen NASA's direction change numerous times with different presidential administrations, and I think the recent contrast uh, in the two administrations with respect to Earth and climate science versus accelerated manned space missions uh, is a prime example. Um, how does this affect NASA's focus, and what safeguards are in place to ensure continuity necessary for long-term projects? Well, although it's my turn, I've got to give this to David because she's just back from Washington, so she's got the latest word on this. Um, well, uh, this is quite a shift. Uh, let me just say that. Um, I was incredibly honored to serve in the Obama administration, and um, it was an administration that was about science and research and innovation and technology, and uh, we couldn't even, we just couldn't run fast enough for the, for the White House, but what a, what a great administration to be in when we were really being pushed to to you know to go 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 and um took a while uh, but the question was you know when when major programs and policy changes and shifts the great thing is that nasa has very few political people the administrator the deputy very very few are our chief financial officer so it's really a cadre of eighteen thousand civil servants and the great thing is you know they they keep everything going and, and the top leadership amongst nasa so nasa today is doing you know, really exactly what it did in January when I left and, and last year, and trying to stick to those milestones. It, it has good morale now. You have to try to keep morale up um, because it's hard if, you know, if, if leadership is changing on you. Right now, the good news is that so far, um, Mars is still a destination. And again, that's the stretch goal, but that kind of makes us all be at our best if we're trying to push out for that and um, think that uh, Mars will stay as the horizon goal in, in the shifting political landscape. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, earth science and climate. I'm an aerospace engineer, you know, I'm not a climate scientist. Why do I show uh, temperature and NASA's earth science data in every one of my talks now? For this reason, I think it's so urgent, I think it's so important. You know, if I have the platform to speak, I'm gonna show that little slice of NASA and the sister agencies because I really do believe it's urgent and I think we just have to, I think the data speaks for itself. To me, it's not political at all, it's just, Let's look at the data and let the data speak. So I think from the outside, uh, pushing, I think we really need to push, um, you know, in terms of uh, policies or policies that are coming up. Because again, I just think it's that critical in terms of the, the earth sciences that we, we need, the world needs. You know, we, uh, we know that the, the earth is changing and, um, you know, there's a lot of carbon dioxide, you know. So, so I, don't, I don't argue, I don't get involved in the politics of it. I just say, here's the data. You know, and I believe in the data, and then what are we going to do about it, and how are we going to change behavior? Um, I will say that, that the, the one thing that did disappoint me in the Obama administration was ending plans to go to the moon. Because uh, I really think, as, as we both said, it's going to be still quite a long time before we can get to Mars. And it's been almost 50 years now since we've explored the surface of another planetary body. And the moon is close, the moon we can get to. I think we need to do it in such a way that we don't lock ourselves into the moon and, and um, prevent ourselves from having the resources eventually to go to Mars when we're ready to go. Um, there's a lot of people in NASA, I think, who feel the same way. And much of the technology that has been under development during the previous administration is not just applicable to Mars, it, it can be used for going to the moon, and, and we are now talking about building this, what they call the Cis Lunar Gateway, where we will move out, first of all, to activities in the vicinity of the moon, and I hope that will eventually get us to the surface of the moon, because 
every other space-faring nation in the world, and as David said, there are there's a huge amount of international space activity. Every other space-faring nation in the world wants to go to the moon. Of course, we've been there. We could, the U.S. could lead an international lunar exploration initiative, and I honestly believe that that would get us to Mars sooner because we'd have this international cooperation in place. We'll just have to see how all that plays out. Final question for me uh, before we open up to the audience. Uh, with continuing improvements in machine sensing, computer vision, and data analysis, it might seem that machines or robots are better equipped than ever to handle the full range of scientific activities in space. Uh, with that being the case, or maybe that isn't the case, uh, but suppose it is, what is the justification for human space exploration at this point in time? Well, let me, let me answer that in two ways. Um, you, you ask about what can humans do scientifically. Um, and, and let me address that first. And I'll just give one example. Uh, one of the uh, principal investigators on, on one of the experiments that's going to Mars in, uh, on the Mars 2020 <coughs> rover, uh, she made her scientific reputation by discovering uh, some Precambrian fossils in the stromatolite regions in Australia. And, and I, we were talking about this, and she said, you know, th these are tiny, tiny little, uh, little things, and, and, and they were stretched out in a, in a layer of rock strata a few hundred yards wide. And she had to go through that entire thing with, with a, a magnifying glass, and, and it took many days, and, and you know, she found about half a dozen. And she said, you know, the, my experiment, there's no way that it, it, it would ever have discovered those. Uh, they, they've done experiments out in the southwest desert with, with robots trying to look for fossils, which, which people find all the time. They, they just don't do it. Um, a, a lot of times when people talk about, oh, robots can do so much, you know, they have this vision of, of 3CPO, you know. If we really had robots like that, our whole civilization, we're talking about a different culture entirely. But our, our robots are, I mean, as I said, I love our robots in space. They've done incredible things. But they're, and Steve, one more example, Steve Squires at Cornell University, who's the principal investigator for the Spirit and, and Opportunity rovers, which have done amazing things. But he pointed out, you know, it, they've been going for a decade. An opportunity is still going. It just completed its marathon, you know, 26 miles in 10 years. He, he could have done all the science that, that Opportunity and Spirit did in a long weekend, or maybe stretch it out to a week. But, um, and when I went up to fix the Hubble Space Telescope, we, there were certain things that I did that robots could have done. But we ran into plenty of problems along the way and, and things that if the robots would not have been programmed for. And so there, there's just so many things that, at least in the current state of robotics, and again, if robot, the robotics are advancing very rapidly and, and uh, you know, who knows what robots and artificial intelligence will be like decades from now. If they get to the point where they can do everything that humans can do, we'll be living in a very different society. Um, that's the scientific justification. I want you to think of what do you think is the first question that people normally ask me when they find out that I've been an astronaut. Think about it for just a minute. Anybody want to volunteer a idea about what that question might be. Yeah? Something to do with the movie Gravity. <laughs> well, you're getting very technical. How does it feel? You got it. What does it feel like to be in space? People are interested in human experience. You can ask a robot what it's like to be in space, but you're not going to get a very satisfactory answer. Robots are great at, they can measure the temperature, the charged particle composition, you know, and so on and so forth, but they can't tell you what it's like to be in space. I really want to find out what it's like to be on the surface of Mars. And I would like to be able to ask a person. And so human experience 
is something that exploration expands. That's what exploration is all about. We do, robots have increased our ability to expand human experience in certain ways, but basic human experience is still basic human experience, and I think there are reasons beyond purely scientific why people are going to be anxious when, the, when we have the technology to go to Mars, you're going to find a lot of people who are anxious to go there and to hear about the stories from the people who do go there just because it's a new and fascinating human experience. And I hope we never lose that fascination. I like, I like Jeff's answers as well, but like, I'll just, uh, the one thing to add is um, to, to try to have you, you know, let's think about it. You know, it's always humans with our machines and our capabilities. So uh, Julie and I actually just went to this fantastic uh, Mars conference, machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, and space. So I really think about it, uh, you know, in that sense. So you give me the best AI, the best robotics, I'm, I'm taking it all. But, you know, it's a fleet of explorers. And I love the smarts and the machines to do um, everything that they can do, especially the you know the you know analyzing the chemistry lab and you know is there evidence for life there? But again, to me, it's really just this fleet of explorers, including the humans, and um, I have no doubt we'll become interplanetary people. Do explore? We go out. You know, is it justified or not? That you know that's you have to see. I think it is in terms of the the inspiration. Um, pushing humanity again, we can do it in a, in a peaceful way. So, I, but again, I think it's just it's going to be people. It's our machines. Can you imagine um, the early explorers? I'm a big sailor, and so can you imagine not going with your boat? Well, I can't imagine exploring without my boat. That's just my machine, right? And the technology. So it's always going to be people in our systems, you know, exploring together. The first human mission. Back to, to Jeff's point about what, what Steve Squire said, the first human mission when we do land on Mars, we've been exploring uh, Mars for 50 years, as we mentioned, right? So in the first month, with a crew of four, we will surpass the entire history of 50 years of exploration. So it changes the footprint, changes the range. So it's not one versus the other, it's just, I think it's just kind of the, net, the natural evolution, and uh, again, definitely time to get you know off planet and things. And the other important thing is, what we learn, it teaches us about Earth. You know, so I like to connect it back home to Earth as well. We're looking for the evidence of life and you know, evidence really of the, you know, for in the universe and the solar system. Because that, why, why is that so important? Mostly because it tells us about you know, our home planet. So again, I like to kind of bring it back to all of our exp exploration out into the solar system does you know, help us really understand really important you know, questions for Earth. So now we'll open up uh, to the audience, and the questions can be for both professors or one, uh, I believe, whatever you like. Questions? Hi. Um, like both of you, I'm uh, crazy about astronomy and exploration in Mars, so um, I was very interested to hear your new interest, uh, <laughs> Professor, uh, your old interest. So my question is about, um, you, you spoke about um, Mars being so small that it cooled down lost its atmosphere. And uh, David, you spoke about uh, the Goldilocks zone and the uh, not too cold, not too hot, being in the habitable zone. Now, Goldilocks refers to being the right distance for liquid water. What I don't hear much about is when we find these exoplanets, about their sizes, because uh, maybe there is also a just right Goldilocks size for, for habitable planets. Because if it's too big, my question to you, you're both uh, aerospace professors, um, if a planet is too big, does the rocket equation stop you from escaping gravity well with a chemical rocket? And does that mean that Earth is even more special than we thought? That's just food for thought. Well, you know, there's two things. You ask about if, if the planet is too big, sure, it would be harder to, I mean, if, if you're talking about humans going there and trying to explore, that would be very difficult. Um, but as far as life being able to evolve there, particularly if life evolves in water, it doesn't care how much gravity it is. I mean, life in the ocean is basically buoyant, and, and uh, so gravity, I, I don't think, is particularly an issue in that case. But you're right, um, it's not just a question of whether the planet right now is in the uh, Goldilocks zone where liquid water can exist, but um, we, you know, we've learned a lot about the early history of the solar system. 
our own solar system, which we think is is far more chaotic than than the relatively peaceful place that it is now. Um, there's also um, ideas that you know if the Earth didn't have uh, a fairly large moon like we have, it it would not be as stable. I mean, there it may be that that life is that that the statistics require a lot more than than just the current presence of liquid water. On the other hand, statistics give me a lot of hope because if there's anything, you know, David talked about the thousands of exoplanets that have now been discovered. Let's remember all of those have been discovered around relatively nearby stars. Uh, we have a hundred billion stars at least in our galaxy and what we've discovered from the survey of just the nearby stars is that there are more planets than stars in our galaxy. So hundreds of billions of planets in our galaxy and hundreds of billions of galaxies in the observable universe. So again, you can do the math. There's lots and lots of planets out there. And as far as we know, the laws of physics and chemistry seem pretty constant throughout the universe. We can tell that with our spectroscopy. So it seems almost inconceivable that life would not have evolved somewhere. Whether it's evolved frequently enough that there will be life close to us that we can detect, that's the, the big question which hopefully uh, we're all waiting for, for a detection which has not come yet. Mine's a, a more philosophical question that kind of tails off of that. You know, we spend all these resources looking for life. What if we you know, we spend all these resources looking for this life, but what happens if we actually do find it? Like what implications does it have for our politics, our culture, our society, and how will that change the science that we do? I'm going to let David talk about implications for, for society, but I'll, I'll talk about implications for science, assuming that, that we could actually study that life. Um, right now, everything we know about biology is based on Earth life. Um, as I said, the, the principles of physics and chemistry seem to apply all over the universe, but is our form of life the only kind of, of life that can develop. Um, trying to understand universal biology, if, if I could talk about that, when you only know about one type of life would be like trying to understand principles of universal linguistics when you only know one language. You just can't do it. So just to find one other form of life, um, and if it turns out to be like our own life, uh, that's fascinating if it turns out to be different, but it will just, you know, we, we'll know infinitely more about life and, and, and biology than we do now. So from a scientific point of view, I, I think it's incredibly valuable. I'm going to let David talk about the social implications. <laughs> so, um, thanks Jeff, I <laughs> appreciate that. Um, I mean, I did the science again. So much, so much to say. Just think, we have to be. We try so hard. We have our head down. We're working so hard, right? And you know, we have to be ready. What What happens when we find it? As again, it took me uh, leaving, you know, MIT for a couple of years to go see the huge portfolio at NASA for me to come back and say, um, "Wow, I think it's within the decade." I mean, the evidence is mounting. I mean, we're learning so much uh, again about you know Mars, about the the Hubble image I showed in the beginning. I love that, that's the Wonderland 2 cluster, the Wonderland 2, yeah, cluster. And I'll tell you a story about Hubble and I'll get back to the societal implications. But the reason I love uh, to sh show and start that image, because I say, you know what, we looked at a really, really dark spot in the, the sky. And it's with the, the Hubble wide field, which, uh, you know, had to be repaired and repaired, thank goodness, to get the precision. But it was, it was just, and it was just as big as your thumbnail. So just imagine just looking out into the universe just as big as your thumbnail and Hubble found 10,000 new galaxies, you know, to Jeff's point about the scale of things that we just, it really is hard to get your mind around. So we're gonna search, you know, we're gonna explore what happens when we find life, and um, we do have to be ready for it. All this searching and exploring. Now, at the practical societal part of it, you know, NASA has an office 
um, in terms of forward and backward contamination. You know, when let's go back to Mars now. If we find life on Mars, we sure don't want it to be ours. <laughs> That's a big issue, right? We have to make sure to keep everything very pristine. If you find life, you know, you want to go there. And then if we do find life, we bring it back to Earth. We need serious, uh, you know, procedures in place about contamination, control. So we, we think about it that way, just in terms of protect, protect maybe other life, protect our life here. So those kind of things are in place, but we really need to have an international discussion you know, outer space treaties, things like that. Does the world agree on what happens next? What happens when, you know, when we do find it? So it's a great, it's a great big question for society. You know, again, I hope uh, we have the discussion at that level at, at the United Nations. You have to have, you know, that discussion at the United Nations. Get all the nations who want to have the discussion to be part of it, uh, because it's not one nation, and it's definitely not one space program that gets to decide that for the for the world at all. If I could speculate, though, you know, there have been sort of fictional stories about the impact of discovering life. Now, you know, maybe if you're a religious fundamentalist and, and you believe all, all that, you know, all, only one life and the Earth is the only planet that could possibly have life, maybe it would bother you. But I, I really suspect that when we do find life, that the general reaction will be incredible excitement, that this is, again, an expansion of human knowledge and experience uh, that will be one of the most exciting discoveries of, of the century. Uh, and, and I really don't think that it will cause any major sociological or, or political harm. That's different from saying, you know, what would happen if the little green men get out of their flying saucers tomorrow? You know, that would obviously have very serious social and political implications, but I'm not really expecting that that's going to happen. We have time for one final question. Hi, uh, my question is about uh, uh, NASA working with uh, commercial entities. Uh, specifically, in the past, uh, the business of going to space used to be integrated within NASA. And now, uh, when you're working with uh, commercial entities, uh, each entity you know, specializing in their own thing, um, I can see that there's a, there could be a loss of uh, expertise uh, integrated between different levels. Um, how, how does NASA address this problem, which I can see being a potential stumbling block for you know, big missions that go to Mars? I'm not sure that it's a stumbling block. Um, I, I think that um, uh, the large number of different approaches to going into space will get us there sooner. I mean, I, I, I love NASA. NASA's been very good to me in my career, but um, I don't think that NASA would have developed the ability to significantly reduce the cost of space flight by reusing the first stage of rockets, which private en enterprise is doing now. And, you know, if anything, that's going to help us get to Mars. That, that's my take on it, David. Yeah, and I would say, um, it kind of gets this point, NASA workforce, we, uh, we have to make sure that actually, that, you know, the excellence uh, is maintained and you want the, the NASA workforce is being reduced a, a little bit right now, but you definitely want the best and the brightest. I want all of you to, <laughs> to go work there as well. So you've got to, you want to you keep... Um, the technological edge and scientific edge, and um, so far so good. I mean, in terms of we don't have enough, you know, uh, positions, government positions, and we can still bring in great people. We need more positions. But now when it comes to the private folks as well, as Jeff said, this is just a win-win situation. It's necessary, it's not just necessary, necessary, I think, for governments to help fund, and that's, you know, economic investment in the companies now. NASA's always funded industry, so it's not just new. I mean, NASA has always funded aerospace industry. So now with um, some of the folks that are really taking a much more risky posture, that's that's great. And so, and I always point out, know, NASA, the government, is not in competition at all with SpaceX, with Blue Origin. It's just there to try to help their success. And hopefully they'll be very commercially successful because it's the pot of money. Then, then you really do get to go to the moon and you get to go to Mars if you don't have to just be stuck in low-Earth orbit. I mean, that's a fantastic place if the commercial guys can, can make a success out of this. 
So I point out that, and it's kind of good if uh, some of the private guys are in competition with, with each other, that's good because guess what? They're gonna make each other better. And they're already doing that. SpaceX, I think, is making Boeing better. I think Boeing is actually making SpaceX better. They have different, they have different strengths and weaknesses. So they're just kind of raising the level, um, you know, with these, with more private guys. So that competition, I think, is really great because it's, you know, it's healthy. It's good competition. But the government's not in competition with those folks. It's just trying to actually make sure, you know, is, that more, more will succeed. So that's that's kind of how I see it. Let, let me give you one one other example. Uh, you may have heard Elon Musk say he, he would like to send one of his dragon capsules, the Red Dragon, to land on Mars. Right now, the, the most mass that NASA can land on Mars with our current technology is about a ton. That's Curiosity, that's going to be the Mars 2020 rover. It needs a supersonic parachute. It's, it's complicated technology. If what... what or, um, SpaceX is proposing is to use hypersonic retropropulsion, which is a technology that NASA is very interested in, and so NASA is going to cooperate. If, if he actually does it, NASA is going to provide deep space network for communications, they're going to provide lots of information that's been collected about the Mars atmosphere, and in return, they will expect to get information about the hypersonic retropropulsion, because Red Dragon weighs seven tons, and, and if we're ever going to put people on, on the Earth, on, on Mars, we've got to be able to, to launch, uh, to land more, more than one ton. And the last thing I'll say, you know, looking, looking ahead to the idea of, you know, if, if a lot of these private companies, I mean, Jeff Bezos has said, why, why are you investing a billion dollars a year in Blue Origin? His answer is, my vision is that someday millions of people are going to be living off the surface of the Earth. Um, I, I don't know when that's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen. But right now, I mean, it's an exciting time. We have, in this country, we have five human space capsules, space transportation systems being developed. Blue Origin, SpaceX, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, and NASA's Orion. That's five at one time. Frankly, NASA doesn't have the business to keep all of those busy. And so they are really looking for uh, a more customer base. And that's why I talked about Bob Bigelow wants to build space station hotels. Um, if, we, we should say, you know, NASA traditionally has spent over a third of its entire budget just to provide the infrastructure to get people into space. If that infrastructure could be supported by the private sector and NASA could buy those services at the marginal cost, then NASA's way ahead of the game and has a lot more money to invest in exploration, which is what we really want to see NASA do. Um, and that's what NASA has basically decided. They're going to leave transportation to near Earth, to low Earth orbit, to the private sector because we know how to do it now. I, th I think there's, there's a tremendous excitement and we still have to wait a couple of years to see how it's all going to work out. Whether all these companies are going to succeed, probably not, but some of them are, and and uh, and it's going to change the way we do business in space. So we're living in an exciting time uh, as far as space goes. And um, you know, I've been privileged. Dave has been privileged. We we were around for Apollo, and I've been able to go into space myself. But the excitement is not over. So we're looking forward to the next few years. Let's thank Professors Newman and Hoffman. And we have, we have some gifts for you as well.